and, and what I started with were Pop Tarts. So I wrote in this article Wait, 10, or tw okay. 10 or 12 years ago. Are you telling ago, me you're the father of Pop Tarts I'm, too? Hey guys, what's going on? This is Paul from ProPhysique.com and I just want to do a little bit of an introduction for this video you're about to see. The gentleman sitting on the couch with me is Dr. Joe Klemzeski, who is, by all intents and purposes, the creator of flexible dieting, the creator of uh, evidence-based approach to contest prep and peaking. Uh, as you'll learn in the interview, he most likely is the person who created the Pop-Tart craze uh, that's associated with flexible dieting. I also learned later on after we shut the camera off that he was the first person to discuss metabolic building or reverse dieting as we currently know it as well. So such a well-rounded guy and uh, just want to do an introduction. I'm really thankful that he spent this time, you know, we were roommates for the camp, but we didn't get to, we didn't get to talk much. So taking that time to do this video was awesome. So I really hope you guys enjoy. Please comment questions below and if you want to get Joe on more of this stuff, let me know because, uh, you know, I'll make it happen. Hey guys, what's going on? This is Paul Ravella from ProPhysique.com and this weekend I'm in Tampa for the Lane Norton VIP Muscle Camp. This is actually the fifth year of the camp and Lane brings in some of the like, utmost experts in the world of fitness, nutrition, strength and performance and uh, just anything related to the fitness uh, world that we live in. And uh, a few, the first year we did this there was one person I was particularly excited to meet, and that was Dr. Joe Klemzeski, who's here with me now, um, because he was Lane's first coach, and he was the one that introduced Lane to so much of what he is so famous for now. Um, I don't know if you want to take all the credit for that, because some of it, <laughs> but regardless, Joe is uh, someone I've always looked up to, and uh, to be fair, quite intimidated by when I first met, but um, after getting to know him for a few years, he's still someone I look up to but uh, even more so now because I've learned so much more about him and he's a uh, multifaceted uh, just very interesting guy but for the for the perspective of this video I think I would like to talk about flexible dieting and its history which probably isn't that well known I don't think it's like a documented thing but um, from the perspective of physique athletes it's not been around for very long uh, but first I'd like to let Joe introduce himself um, maybe explain a little bit of his background for anyone that's not real familiar with you. So why don't we start with that? Alright man. Well, hey guys, thanks for tuning in and it's always a pleasure to be with Paul as well. Uh, somebody who's really come up in the sport and is really focused on just doing the best for your own athletes. So I look Thank up you. to you as well for that. Um, my background, I grew up, I'll start really early, I grew up as a kind of an unathletic, chubby little kid in, in a family that didn't care much about health and nutrition or anything related to health. So by the time I was kind of hitting puberty and getting getting fat, we you know, kind of an overweight family as well, I had decided at some point, like 12 years old, that I wanted to play sports, got involved in baseball, and, and, and I had an old coach, like one of these old school 70 year old guys who just said, lift weights, you gotta lift weights, lift yeah. weights to get stronger. Good. So I ended up doing that and uh, I responded well, I lost weight, I was pretty happy about that as I continued to play baseball through high school, uh, still training, I developed a physique that was, you know, kind of genetically okay, you know, better than most of my peers, so ended up getting into bodybuilding. And by the time I was 20, well, first of all, I started training pretty aggressively, like yeah. like haven't missed a, a week unintentionally since at about 12 years old. Yeah. So buying all the magazines, doing all that thing. And so when I was 16, I said, well, I, I want to compete in my first show by the time I'm 21. I want to become a pro by the time I'm 30. And you laugh at this one, I wanted to be Mr. Olympia, right? Sure. I, I was still that delusional kid that thought anybody yeah. could do that. Um, but I actually did my first show when I was 20. And just a few years later, I remember I was in college and I had met this guy who was some, some kind of a coach. People said, well, this guy helps people get ready you know, for shows. And so, and, and somebody convinced me, this guy I competed with said, you gotta talk to me, you gotta talk to me, you gotta talk to him. Okay. That was, that was in Evansville, Indiana. I was from Northern Indiana. But this guy laid out a plan for me. And he said, you know, this is what I want you to do. He measured things in 
units, units of protein, and servings of carbs. And basically, it was just a Xerox copy of Chris Aceto's work from Flex Magazine. Okay. So this goes back more than 20 years, probably almost 25 years ago. So I got involved in dieting that way. And um, it, there was just, you know, kind of some questions I was asking, you know, hey, what about, uh, you know, this food? Like, why, can't, why isn't this on the list? Can I eat this? No, you can't eat it. It's not on the list. Well, why, why isn't it on the list? Right. And so I just mathematically started figuring out what ounces really meant according to food fact panels and all that kind of stuff. And I said, well, why can't I just eat the foods I want in this? And he just said, you can't do that. But I did it anyway. And of he, course, I didn't no, he didn't have a reason. He had no reason, no reason at all. And, and the more I got to, to kind of know what was happening in the industry, of course, people just used these exchange lists. He, even at the time, a book that became pretty popular was Barry Sears. And, and he, you know, in his zone diet called, you know, blocks. He had blocks of this. And so everybody had these different exchange lists. Okay. And, and I just simply wanted the freedom to eat what I wanted as long as I could do the math. It sure. didn't seem hard to me. So as long as it was a, a good food, you know, you know, just high Were quality. Were you studying nutrition at that time? Uh, not at the time. I was in physical therapy school. Okay. So my, my first degree was in physical therapy. Started out in actually business and marketing and then switched to physical therapy. And, and I went through this particular period of my contest life, you know, in, in undergrad. So, so doing that had not yet. Yeah. catapulted into nutrition. I'm just curious because it seems like a little bit forward thinking or at least on your part not assuming that there are certain foods that were magic as so many people assume early on in their nutrition careers like there's a reason why you eat broccoli because it has an impact that something else wouldn't have so I was just curious where you got the idea why can't I just eat what I want as opposed to what was on the list yeah, I, I, it was probably just curiosity. Yeah. You know, why, why aren't these foods? What's wrong with this? Yeah. You know, what, one of my things, it was funny, because we went to, you know, kind of a Sam's Club type place, yeah. and, and I was eating these, these animal crackers, because yeah. they were like zero fat, and you could control how much carbs by whatever yeah. you were So I thought, you know, this is a good food. And he said, oh, no, you can't eat that, you can't eat that. Like, well, why can't I eat it? So, you know, even down to vegetables, I, you yeah. know, he had a very limited range of vegetables, like green beans, green beans, green beans. And you know, I wrote this story for the yeah. uh, If It Fits site. You know, I, I wanted peas. Yeah. For some reason, I like peas. I'm like, why can't I eat peas? And so again, that's a higher starch type vegetable. Yeah. But you know, so I just ate less of them. But I ate peas. So, at what point did you start coaching athletes yourself? You know, since I since I started competing early at about age 20. Uh, I was already just insatiably curious about how these other people were so good. You know, my genetics were just kind of average and I would compete against these monsters. So I, w I was kind of like a young journalist. I was asking them questions. What do you do? What do you do? What do you do? Yeah. And I didn't really have the science background yet, but I, I was kind of looking for that magic formula. And um, by the time I had graduated PT school, I was really enveloped in bodybuilding as just a okay. you know, self-indulgence, a sport that I wanted to do. So. So that's what I went on and, and got my master's in, in health and, and my first doctorate in nutrition, purely for those selfish reasons. I just wanted to be a better bodybuilder and I was fascinated by it, so I, I went to school, you know, never planning to do anything with it. And then in that process, people started reaching to you saying, would you help me because you had attained a lot of success or at least learned how to reach success? Yeah, I think personally, as I started improving and getting better and, and sharing that information, then yeah, people would ask questions, and, and at some point I remember just, just offering assistance to a friend. You know, hey, if, you know, you're a phenomenal bodybuilder. Yeah. We've been competing against each other for years, uh, and he had just won his pro card, and, and he didn't look very good. He didn't look as good as I knew he could, and and I had already been improving, doing well. I was already keeping water in. I was keeping sodium in. I was yeah. doing all those things that were counterintuitive to the industry, but with my newfound knowledge and physiology that just none of that stuff made sense so i kept seeing these people underperform you know as everybody says i always look better the day after the show why did i look so horrible the day of the show and i said well i can fix that i can help yeah so I, you know i started just helping some people and then at one point i decided you know actually there's a funny story to this but you know to do it as a career trying sure. to monetize it it was purely because i was writing for a magazine already and we were trading ad space for my my editorial articles. Okay. 
And at one point, the business I was using to advertise for, we, we just decided to shut it down. So I had nothing to advertise. Okay, so you had no advertisement for that month. So on, on a particular Friday, the editor emailed and said, hey Joe, I need, I need your ad for Monday. And it just dawned on me, I have nothing to advertise. And so over the weekend, I thought, well, I wonder if people would pay for contest prep. Okay. So I put this little third page ad, this is almost 20 years ago. Is this like a natural bodybuilding magazine? Natural bodybuilding and fitness. Okay. I put a little third page ad that said contest peaking specialist and had my picture, my name, phone number, yeah. and that started it all. And it said Dr. K? I think it was yeah, Dr. Joe, which is a lot Dr. of Joe, okay. people, you know, an advertising agency who did that at one point. And so they, the initial plans when you were creating for people were the diets set up in such a way that they had the flexibility to choose macros or did you provide a meal plan and explain how they could exchange things? At, at that point, I would create a macronutrient profile okay. just like I was taught with units or exchange lists or mm -hmm. blocks and this and that and so I said, well, it makes more sense to speak a common language. The first thing you learn in science is you have to define things. You have right. to speak the same language. So I said, these are nutrition fact panels. This is way more precise. So we can we don't have to convert something to an exchange list and then deconvert it back to something that makes sense. Right. So I just said, let's all talk the same language. Let's just talk protein, carbs, and fats in grains. And, and to my knowledge, that's the first time that was ever done. I mean, even even something like Weight Watchers. I mean, flexible dieting existed in the form of a places point, like that, point, like point, point systems. systems. Yeah. But you could eat what you wanted. Right. Yeah. It, to my knowledge, but they was, didn't do anything as far as I'm as far as I'm aware with uh, ratios of the macronutrients. Absolutely not. It's just purely caloric absolutely. intake. Yeah. So, for from a body composition standpoint, I think macros are obviously superior to calories. I, I think so. Yeah. So They're more specific. So not only did you kind of usher in macronutrient as a way of dieting, you also ushered in the the peaking protocols where we stopped diuretics stopped cutting sodium, water, carb depleting and carb slamming without ingesting water and sodium, which is just silly that we you know that we know that now. So you, you must have got a lot of looks from bodybuilders like you were insane. Yeah, I mean I started writing this stuff in 1998. That's the first time Steve Downs asked me to write for Natural Bodybuilding yeah. Fitness. So that's that's 18 years ago. Yeah. And of course, nobody was doing that at this time. I mean, no, it, it was the first time in the history of the sport somebody said, "Let's keep water in. Let's not, you know, carb deplete and carb load and sodium yeah. deplete and you know sodium load and all that." And yeah, I mean, people thought that was incredibly bizarre, but they started trying it. And something, getting something results. I've always thought though is that if you take someone who's not quite stage lean, and you do some of this manipulations, they will look better for a short period of time. So, uh, do you find that to be true? Like, if you take someone who's maybe, you know, what we would consider like six or eight weeks out from a show, and do some of these crazy manipulations where you pull things out, there might be an hour window where things are moving in a certain direction sure. that they look a little leaner than they actually are. Sure. Um, do you think maybe this was a way for coaches to kind of take someone that shouldn't be on stage and kind of get them a little better? I really think it was just. You know, it goes back to why people believe what they believe about anything, right. and it's just association. It's you know, if if it thunders outside and we don't know anything, we think the gods are angry or something. Zeus throwing a light right, 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 right. Yeah. So you think when I when I look water, like if if you if you are a certain body composition right. and then you overeat, you look watery, right? right? Like all of a sudden everything is jiggly and moving around, and yeah. so people think that's water. And, and of course some of it is, because with, with interstitial fluids spilling over yeah. it is, but it's also a little bit of triglyceride, a little bit of body fat. So we start associating that that's actually water. So if we get rid of water, I'll look tighter. Okay. And, and you can see that even you know 20 years ago when I was asking these competitors as I was getting into it, you know, oh, he's just holding a little water. You know, yeah. He's just got a little water on his back. No, that's actually fat. He just wasn't yeah. leaning. It's still a common feedback you get from a judge would be, you just have, you're just holding a little water. Yeah. Just come in drier. And I've actually had clients do shows and fill out and be so hard that the judges will tell them that they needed more water. Mm -hmm. They were too hard. So, and, and ironically, I think the dry look is actually a fully carved up, fully Absolutely. hydrated athlete who hasn't spilled. 
Yeah, there's Absolutely. nothing in the interstitial layer. The muscles are full. And, and to your point, you know, can you look better for a short window? Absolutely. I mean, homeostatically, you're making your body react. And the problem is you're always going to have some trailing effect where you overreact in your right. body. So you're going to be swinging one way or the other. Right. So the best type of peaking protocol is to control as many variables as you can heading all in one direction where you can right. predictably land in a certain place. Because, again, another thing that cracks me up all the time is somebody who says, well, I, I missed my peak by 10 minutes. You know, I looked, I looked way better 10 minutes before, or, or damn those expediters, they ran the class late and, and yeah. I missed my peak. No, you should look pretty similar, pretty good for hours at a stretch. Yeah. You know, as you're eating food, eating meals, I mean, your body does respond a little bit, but it's right. not like magically you look perfect in one point in time. Right. So at what point, because you stayed in the coaching industry, you know, up, I mean, even to today you coach still, but you were pretty involved up until a few years ago. Um, at what point did you notice that flexible dieting became less about being eating a, a, a good solid whole food diet and hitting your goals to let's get away with as much crap as we can and say we're getting good results from it? It's probably about 10 years ago, um, and again, these are all in articles I've written. I could, I could find out the exact dates. But when I was getting ready for contests, I, it, it, most of this is through research. I'm reading biochemistry textbooks from school and so forth. And, and I knew fasted cardio, this goes back at least 10 years ago, was just inferior because you need more of a metabolic boost. Uh, a small amount of calories you can consume pre-workout is, is only going to make you more thermogenic. Right. You, know, you, you know your heart rate gets up faster and so forth. So I started, even though I was still doing cardio in the morning, I would wake up and have maybe a graham cracker or something like that. Right. It, or even just a chocolate chip cookie. Yep. So I might have 20, 25 calories and, and so forth. And I noticed I'm getting a way better effect. So I started doing that also for my pre-workouts. And, and what I started with were Pop-Tarts. So I wrote in this article Wait, 10, or tw wait, 10 or 12 years ago. Are you telling ago, me you're the father of Pop-Tarts uh, too? <laughs> uh, embarrassingly, yes. That's. Wow. That, that you hear that, Alberto Nunez? It wasn't you. That came from an article I wrote, you know, maybe a dozen years ago, where I said, you know, for example, as I'm trying to explain sure. why some bad food might be actually good for you contextually. Sure. That I, I said, I, I feel like one pop tart is like the perfect pre-workout. It's meal. like 35 sugar, four yeah. fat, right? So it's, it's, it's digest it's easily. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So I did that, and I wrote this article, and all of a sudden, everybody's carrying boxes of pop tarts to the gym. And then I moved on to like Reese peanut butter cups. I think mean, these are way better. So now everybody's eating Reese peanut butter cups. And these are all just coming yeah. from that one little magazine I was writing for. But yeah. obviously information. Well, at that time, because I can attest to my early beginnings in the fitness world were based on those magazines. And, you know, anything that the Weeders published or, you know, had Arnold on the cover, I definitely read. And, you know, for better or worse, I will say that, you know, I can say I tried it all. So I have no regrets about uh, the mistakes I made because it, it made me who I am now. I think the generation now has so much more access to information and it's just phenomenal the speed at which you know you can improve. Um, but the fact that it, it doesn't seem like that long ago, but it seems like ancient history at the same yeah. time. Yeah. The fact that so been around a full generation. All right, so we have here Dr. Joe who has done some amazing things. Uh, why don't you tell us what you're doing now because. Joe's presentation this year was a little different. In the past, he's done presentations on peaking, contest peaking, and showed pictures of his clients, uh, you know, before and after peaking properly, and uh, it was always amazing. But this year, he he did a, a 180 and uh, did a presentation on entrepreneurship, which I got to be honest, uh, it perked me up in my seat because I've seen your presentation on peaking, and although it's awesome, I have a photographic memory. I remember every slide. The entrepreneurship uh, is something that I'm personally interested in because I'm an entrepreneur now technically. You know, I, I run my own business, uh, you know, as a coach and uh, there's many things that I'm getting involved in that I'm interested in. And so why don't you explain just a little, just briefly how that transition came from becoming the top coach in the industry because without a doubt Dr. Joe was at one time and could still be if he wanted to be the number one coach in the industry to what what gave you that transition to go to the more, I want to call it general population or? Uh, uh, um, exactly 20 years ago, I was you know working in physical therapy 
and the, the first wave of managed care was kind of hitting the, the medical community. And, and I wasn't happy any longer with just a decreasing amount of time I could spend with my patients and, and really helping them one-on-one. -on -one. I, I really did a lot of manual orthopedic physical therapy and I just couldn't do that anymore. So I had won my pro card with the WNBF and I had just finished my first doctorate and I was becoming, again, more disillusioned with physical therapy. So I thought, you know, I, I just want to do something entrepreneurial. I was looking to, to get out of Northern Indiana and do something. So a friend of mine was managing a small private gym in Evansville, Indiana, and he, uh, he, he presented me this opportunity. He said, the owner of this gym, who you know, he had put it in this corporate building, wants to sell. He said, I'm not in a position to buy it. I'm getting ready to leave town. I think it'd be perfect for you. Yeah. And it was just the right thing at the right time, so I bought this gym. So all of a sudden, I'm 27 years old, and you know, I, I leave everything behind and, and take a risk on this gym. And it was one of the best and worst decisions ever because I had no idea what I was doing. And as revenue was in decline, I had no idea how to manage a business, I ended up having to get a job as a physical therapist to support my business. So I'm working part-time, trying to run a business full-time. So I'm learning about business the hard way. And gradually, you know, things turn around and I start creating nutrition programming. I'm doing all these things and we grew our staff, grew our revenue by over 700% in two years. And I started learning that nutrition was a key piece. People come to any fitness professional, not necessarily because they want to bench press 400 pounds or hurt or get sore or learn how to do anything in the gym. They just want to lose weight and they want to feel better. That's what the general population wants. So whether they go to a, a big box weight loss chain or they go to a gym, something like that, they all want the same thing. So I started achieving that through nutrition programming. And I realized very quickly that even though my fun career and hobby as a bodybuilder was just that. Yeah. If I want to make it in business, I have to have a better, more focused target. What would you say the percentage of the population is interested in physique competition? Uh, I, I th at one time I tried to calculate this and I think it's like a millionth of one percent. I mean, that's how so many less people... Less than a percent. Yeah, less than a percent of people and, will ever get on a stage. How many people are interested in nutrition? 60% 60, 60 of people spend money dieting every year. Well, well guys, I, I think I'm going to end it there because uh, we're getting knocks on the door. It's the hotel late at night, and Dr. Joe's been so kind with his time. But thank you so much. Hey, man. Appreciate and, uh, it. We'll do it again next year. So hope you guys enjoy. If you have any questions or comments below, I'll try to get Dr. Joe on the, on the comment section. Yeah, let's do it.